Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenna Burbich, and I'm a program officer here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and thank you to our members in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. If you are not yet a member, please consider joining. We have a wide range of levels for you to consider. The Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Please silence your phones, but not your voices. This event is on the record and we are live streaming. And we welcome your social media engagement. Later, we'll be taking audience questions from the room and online at chi.cnf.io. Finally, before I turn it over to our speaker tonight, a few brief words of introduction. We are delighted to welcome back Ambassador Hussein Haqqani. He is the Director for South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute. Previously, he served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2011 and was Pakistan's ambassador to Sri Lanka from 1992 to 1993. He also served as an advisor to four Pakistani prime ministers, Benazir Bhutto, Ghulam Mustafa Joytoy, Yusuf Raza Gilani, and Nawaz Sharif. His latest book, Reimagining Pakistan, Transforming a Dysfunctional Nuclear State, will be available for signing from the bookseller following the program. I will be back to moderate the audience Q&A, but for now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you to the audience. Uh, it's probably my sixth visit uh, to the Chicago Council. I've come here for almost each one of my books and a couple of other occasions. Always good to come to Chicago and always great to interact with all of you. Um, few po foreigners visit Pakistan these days, but most people who interact with Pakistanis, and probably many of you do, uh, some of you probably have a Pakistani dentist, a Pakistani doctor, uh, and certainly have come across a Pakistani cab driver, uh, each one of you would probably attest to the fact uh, that Pakistanis are quite a nice people. Uh, wonderful, charming, engaging, uh, caring. Uh, Pakistanis who live abroad uh, as unskilled labor in the Middle East or cab drivers and factory workers in Europe, doctors, engineers, bankers, or other professionals in North America, they have all had a reputation for hard work and efficiency. Still, Pakistan attracts headlines such as references to the most dangerous place on earth, unstable country, terror uh, terrorist incubator, fragile, and the land of the intolerant, a relatively recent headline uh, on a New York Times op-ed. So the question is, how do we reconcile such a wonderful people, such warm and engaging people, such generally likable people uh, coming from a country that attracts such negative epithets? Uh, Pakistanis in particular, and those who have a sympathetic disposition towards Pakistan, uh, get very upset and say, that uh, Pakistan has an image problem. In my new book, Reimagining Pakistan, which I'm sure many of you will buy after this uh, conversation, I make the argument that Pakistan does not have an image problem. It has a policy problem. And what we see as criticism of Pakistan is not the criticism of the Pakistani people, uh, millions of whom are going about their normal lives and doing things that people of other nations do, but rather a criticism of the policies pursued by the Pakistani state and government. Uh, Pakistan, when it was created in 1947, was an anomaly. It had an eastern wing and a western wing, separated by 1,000 miles of India, uh, which was declared to be Pakistan's enemy on day one. Uh, East Pakistan became Bangladesh in 1971. Uh, uh, and since then, uh, Pakistan has been mired in uh, one controversy after another, a nuclear program that was built after promising the United States that it will not be built, uh, uh, support for jihadi extremism, uh, even after the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, um, of the discovery of Osama bin Laden, which I uh, had to deal with as Pakistan's ambassador to the US, raising the question, was he there with the approval and connivance of uh, people in authority, or was he there uh, because the people in authority were incompetent enough to let the world's most wanted terrorist uh, live there. Uh, 
Uh, so my explanation for Pakistan's dysfunction, and Pakistan is definitely dysfunctional, is that when Pakistan was created, Pakistan inherited 19% of British India's population, 17% of British India's resources, but 33% of British India's army. The reason why it inherited such a large army was a function of the policy that the British pursued, which they termed as martial races theory in India. Uh, they did not want uh, to uh, recruit too many soldiers from any single ethnic group, and certainly not from the majority Hindus, uh, because that would then create an army that might end up uh, overthrowing the British. So the British ended up recruiting more Muslims, uh, a majority of whom came from the area that ended up becoming Pakistan. And when partition occurred, that army, because it had not yet been uh, demobilized after the Second World War, was handed over to Pakistan. Pakistan did not start its life like other countries, figuring out as they move forward who is their enemy, what is the threat that they face, and then raising an army to match the threat. Pakistan inherited an army. And therefore, because it already had an army, had to match threats to the size of the army they inherited. That has created Pakistan's fundamental dysfunction. Pakistan became an American and Western ally during the Second World War, uh, primarily to get assistance and aid to be able to pay for this large army. And of course, the Americans at that time found it useful and convenient because they thought that this army would be available for deployment uh, in any Cold War situation, especially in Asia. Uh, but Pakistan's own national narrative was that Pakistan's enemy was India, out of which Pakistan had been carved out. Uh, Pakistan was not created with much forethought. Uh, at the time of partition, for example, on the day of partition, Pakistan's map had not yet been fully determined. The uh, division of the two large provinces of India that were to be divided to accommodate the idea of Pakistan, Punjab and uh, 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 Bengal, uh, that division occurred just a day after the independence, uh, the declaration of the independence of the two countries. Pakistan and India actually were both declared independent by the British by an act of parliament, which uh, was effective the 15th of August. Now, those of you who live in Chicago know that Pakistan, because I, there's a sizable Pakistani community, Pakistanis celebrate their independence day on the 14th of August. There's a funny story to that as well. In 1948, one year after independence, Pakistan did celebrate its independence day on the 15th of August, which is the actual independence day. But then, when the Pakistani cabinet met after the independence day, somebody complained that the international media talked about India's independence day, but dismissed Pakistan only in one line in the report. And so somebody said, how are we different if we are going to have independence on the same day, if we look alike, if our language is similar, if our diet is the same. After all, a lot of restaurants in this town call themselves Indian slash Pakistani cuisine because the cuisine is not very different. The only difference was religion. So the decision was made to emphasize the difference rather than to emphasize the similarities. And the hope that Pakistan's founder, Mr. Jinnah, had expressed that India and Pakistan will live like the United States and Canada do was dashed soon after independence. Uh, Pakistan had not prepared for the British policy of uh, princely states. There were 500 and, um, 32 princely states in the subcontinent, and they were all to determine which of the two countries they were going to go to. I'm not going to dwell too much on partition. I advise everybody to read about it on its own, because it's one of those seminal in events in history that needs to be understood. Uh, uh, but it was more a frenzy of the moment, rather than something that had been done after a lot of forethought. So. The, uh, uh, the uh, uh, partition created uh, divided families. Uh, it also created a huge anomaly. Uh, Pakistan was supposed to be the Muslim part of South Asia, but one third of the Muslims of South Asia were going to be left behind in India anyway. And the two thirds who were going to be in Pakistan were going to be divided by 1,000 miles of territory. They were not going to be contiguous to each other. The princely states were told that they should join the princes 
should join one of the two, depending on their contiguity and the majority of their population. Almost all princely states on the Indian side made their decisions pretty quickly. One or two, uh, Hamdan Hod, uh, the uh, ruler of Hyderabad state, was a Muslim. The majority population was Hindu. He wanted to be independent. That independence was taken away by force by the Indians because the population was Hindu majority and they didn't want to allow either an independent Hyderabad ruled by a Muslim or a Hyderabad that could have a relationship, separate relationship with Pakistan. The, the uh, states that were to be part of Pakistan had not made their decision of joining Pakistan well until after Independence Day because no one had bothered to negotiate the accession with them. Uh, because as I said, it was created in a frenzy. Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, known as the Qaeda, you know, the great leader, showed up in Karachi, was sworn in, flags were flown, everybody, and then there was, of course, the riots that took place, the religious riots that pushed a lot of Hindus and Sikhs out of what is today Pakistan into India, and a lot of Muslims from the, uh, the uh, Punjab province in particular and some other regions of India into Pakistan. Um, amid all of that, nobody thought about negotiating with the princely states. And the one princely state that became problematic was the state of Jammu and Kashmir, Hindu ruler, Muslim majority, the ruler, originally had a standstill agreement with Pakistan saying we'll keep things as they are and we'll decide as time comes by. But when Pakistan sent in a Lashkar, a tribal Lashkar, uh, calling them Mujahideen, to, uh, to, to get Kashmir by force, uh, India militarily intervened, and then that became a bone of contention. Uh, now, the fact of the matter is that Pakistan has spent 70 years of its life primarily competing with India. And most Pakistanis, uh, when they are asked to define why Pakistan exists, define it in terms of opposition to India. Hindus and Muslims of the subcontinent could not live together is the standard explanation. That's why they had to create two separate countries. If that is the case, and if there is an eternal and uh, permanent com conflict between two communities, then obviously there is no resolution except going on creating a stronger military and going on increasing uh, 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 military capability, including a nuclear capability. What that has resulted in is that Pakistan is the world's sixth largest country by population, sixth largest country in terms of size of military, sixth largest nuclear arsenal, 11th most firepower of any country, that's a, that's a designation of you know, what, how, how much firepower you wield in terms of, you may have a large military, but how much can you, uh, how much can you punch in firepower, number 11, but in economic size, number 42. Uh, by nominal GDP and number 26 by uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, on the other hand, in other criteria, it's even worse. Uh, Pakistan is number 52 uh, by the number of books that are published every year. Uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, standing in human development, which is a measure of how well your country does in education and healthcare and the facilities it provides its people, uh, all of that Pakistan is, done, is, is doing even worse. Uh, Pakistan has no, made progress since its inception. There is no doubt about that. Life expectancy in 1959 was only 40. It has risen to 40, uh, 66 now. There are fewer Pakistanis living in poverty. The literacy rate has quintuple, quintupled. I always uh, falter on that one. Quintupled since independence. Uh, the, it was 11% at the time of independence. It's 56% now. But these can't be taken, these figures can't be taken in isolation. For example, India, which had a literacy rate of 12% in 1947, now has a literacy rate of 75%. Why is Pakistan's uh, as 54%? Why is the difference that was only 1% in 47 now a difference of more than 20%? Uh, similarly, uh, there are other issues. Uh, Pakistan has the third largest illiterate population globally. There are only 15 countries in the world with a lower literacy rate than Pakistan. And the national literacy figure actually shrunk by 2% over the last two years. Uh, the Education Development Index of the United Nations Development Program ranked Pakistan at 146 out of 195 countries. 
Pakistan has the lowest primary and secondary, and secondary school enrollment rates in South Asia. Nepal, poorer than Pakistan, much smaller than Pakistan, has a 15 uh, has has a 15 percent rate of enrollment uh, of school graduates uh, in colleges. Pakistan's rate is nine. 0.9%. So only 9.9% 9 .9 of those who go complete secondary school in Pakistan, higher secondary school, end up in university. Uh, only 49% of Pakistan's school going age children, children between the age of 5 and 15, complete primary education. Uh, Pakistan's budgetary allocation for education, which is a meager 2% of GDP, is abysmally low and actual expenditure, 1.5% of GDP, is even lower. Uh, estimates have been made that show that just one-fifth of Pakistan's military budget would be sufficient to finance primary, uh, universal primary education. Uh, now, if you compare these statistics with the fact that Pakistan has one of the youngest populations in the world, uh, the uh, the uh, average age in Pak uh, the, the median age in Pakistan is 23, so that means that about 100 million Pakistanis are under the age of 23. This young population, if it's not educated, if its skills are not developed, then it will not necessarily uh, be uh, able to contribute significantly to increasing Pakistan's standing in the world in other areas. Uh, there are other statistics as well, and let me just get the statistics out of the way just to give you an idea of why I call Pakistan dysfunctional before somebody raises their hand and says, why do you word, use the word dysfunctional for Pakistan? Um, Health is another area. Uh, Pakistan has about 38% 30, of Pakistanis live in cities, in urban areas, and yet the government spends only 1% of the GDP on public health care and 0.2% of the national budget on health. Uh, it is, Pakistan is one of the countries where typhoid uh, remains endemic, with over half a million people contracting this disease. And despite the best efforts of Bill Gates and the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates, uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Zayed, uh, uh, Pakistan still is one of the three countries in the world where polio has not been completely eliminated. Uh, part of it is what I call overlapping problems. Radical Islamists do not allow universal uh, 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 vaccination, and therefore polio doesn't get completely eliminated. Why are radical Islamists there? Well, those of you who have heard me speak on, on, my, on my previous two, three books probably have heard that ad nauseum, but I'll touch on that in a bit as to why radical Islamism is still a major factor in Pakistan. Uh, the World Economic Forum ranked Pakistan's overall ability to compete in the global economy at 122 out of 138 countries. Uh, Pakistan's higher education and training was ranked at 123 out of 138. Uh, Pakistan has one of the lowest tax to GDP ratios in the world of around 9.9%. Uh, and its population is still growing at more than 2% every year. Uh, Pakistan's global human capital index ranking, now. The Human Capital Index basically measures how is a nation doing in investing in human capital and preparing the next generation uh, through education and employment across the life cycle to enhance uh, its ability uh, to perform well economically as, as, as things go forward. Um, that ranking of Pakistan is 125 out of 130 countries. So in case you're not fully convinced, let me give you a few other statistics. Pakistan stands at 147 out of 188 countries in the world on the Human Development Index, which measures health, standard of living, and education. Uh, DHL finances something called the Global Connectedness Index, which measures cross-border flows of trade, capital, information, and people. It places Pakistan at 99 out of 140 countries. Pakistan ranks 158th on the UN e-government survey, which places it in the bottom 30 countries according to the United Nations Development Program. Then there is something called the Quality of Nationality Index, uh, 
I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, in this audience who has a Pakistani passport, but those who have a Pakistani passport know what that problem is. Basically, the quality of national, uh, nationality index means that your, how effective is your passport in getting you across the world? Uh, so um, most of you uh, having American passports know that uh, a Canadian passport travels a little bit better than an American passport in many parts of the world. Uh, a German passport right now is the best passport to have because more countries allow people with a German passport to just enter upon arrival without necessarily needing visas or prior clearances. Pakistan has, in that sense, one of the worst passports in the world. Its passport ranks at 153 out of 160 countries, and Pakistanis can travel to only 23 places in the world without a visa. Uh, now, on the one hand, there are all these rankings. There is another index called the Fragile States Index. It's an annual ranking of 178 nations on the basis of their levels of stability and the pressures they face. Pakistan falls under the high alert countries and ranks number 14 in this negative index. So why has Pakistan ended up in this position is the question that I attempt to answer in almost all of my books, but especially in reimagining Pakistan. My core argument is that Pakistan's excessive focus on national security and on competition with India has made it oblivious to all the other factors, including education, healthcare, development, etc. Secondly, the definition of India as a permanent enemy and Islam as the only unifier of a di disparate group of ethnicities has made Pakistan into, quote unquote, an ideological state. Pick up any Pakistani school textbook from grade five onwards, and it says Pakistan is an ideological state. The problem with ideological states is that they have less flexibility in policy making. Uh, who they can befriend, or what, or what they can do in relation to other nations, what they can teach their children, uh, how they interact. Uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the rest of the world, and the kind of economic opportunities they can uh, pursue are all then determined by this so-called ideology. Uh, the combustible mix of religion and politics, uh, the pursuit of nuclear weapons, the acceptance and encouragement of terrorism, and the angry tone in Pakistan's relations with the rest of the world are all byproducts of the indignation that helped create Pakistan and has, has since been nurtured by the Pakistani state. My argument is that in 1947, a lot of people who had been born Indians became Pakistani overnight. They needed a rationale and a reason for why they had become Pakistanis when the day before, they were Indians. Everybody was Indian on the 13th of August, 1947. By the 15th of August, 1947, some of them had become Pakistani, primarily by virtue of being Muslim. Uh, but not all Muslims of the subcontinent became Pakistanis. And we are going to have an ironic situation by about 2025 when the number of Muslims in India outnumbers the number of Muslims in Pakistan. Uh, so my argument is that now, in the year 2018, 95.5% of Pakistan's population comprises people who were born after Pakistan had been created, including myself. We have known no other country except Pakistan as our home. So we don't really need an explanation and a twisted version of history and a uh, ahistorical ideological divide that says, by virtue of being subcontinent Muslims, we have to hate Hindus, and therefore we have to hate India, and therefore Pakistan's rationale is Islam and opposition to India. We are Pakistanis by birth. And so what we can actually have is a functional territorial state and a territorial nation, which basically focuses on all the list of things that I have uh, I have pointed out, education, healthcare, getting on with life, becoming more prosperous, making life easier for our people, instead of fighting uh, battles that have been defined over time and in ideological terms. Now, uh, I also say that nations, uh, 
Benedict Anderson wrote a book called Imagined Communities. Nations are imagined communities. Uh, why, are, why, why are people in fl uh, Florida and Alaska who have never met each other bound by the same national identity? Because they have the same national imagination. They have the same, although right now people can argue that that's also like this too. It's 49.7 of the one, 49.6 of the other. But, but basically you get my point, that, the, uh, that nations are, uh, are bound by this invisible thread of identity that is essentially a shared imagination. So the Pakistani imagination revolves around this ideological conflict. The Hindu-Muslim divide, the two-nation theory, uh, the, uh, the inability of two communities to live in the same region, none of it absolute, absolutely historically true. At that particular moment, yes, the two communities fought each other. But then, for many years, they also lived together. Uh, there were Hindu rulers in states with lots of Muslim subjects. There were Muslim rulers in, uh, in, in, in India with Hindu subjects. They got along. Pakistan also does not, fear any, uh, does not face an existential threat anymore. It's not like in the time, at that time, the division in India was people who wanted Pakistan and people who didn't want Pakistan. It's not like anybody now says, we have to eliminate Pakistan to move forward. People in the neighborhood, whether it's Afghans or Iranians, whether it's uh, India or the Chinese, everybody accepts Pakistan. Plus, Pakistan has guaranteed its security with nuclear weapons. When you have nuclear weapons, you should feel more secure, not less. Instead, Pakistan has made that into an ideological layer of insecurity as well. It is assumed that, quote unquote, the West wants to take away our nuclear weapons. So now, not only are the Indians our enemy, but the West is also our enemy. And so this constant paranoia then feeds a nation, national debate that is based on conspiracy theories. I have a very interesting chapter. Now I'm trying to get you all to buy the book um, uh, in, the, in, in the Great American Tradition of Advertising. Um, I, my book has a chapter on conspiracy theories. And some of them will make you laugh. Some of them will make you chuckle. Some of them will make you pause. Uh, all of them will make you cry if you think from the point of view of the poor Pakistani people. That what, I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy theories in this country too right now. And it's a sad moment in that sense. But for a country to have lived with conspiracy theories for as long as Pakistan has lived, uh, it is particularly disturbing. Uh, there are uh, Pakistani propagandists who think that Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, uh, former communists, uh, 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 and India are all part of the same conspiracy to try and break up or weaken Pakistan, to which my joke is, if all of those guys can be brought together to oppose Pakistan, boy, the world is headed for a very different kind of world because those Iran and Israel don't talk to each other. <laughs> if, they can, if they can conspire together to demolish Pakistan, then there is something interesting happening that nobody has been understanding and picking up on. Pakistan also limits debate. The reason why I'm in Pakistan uh, and not in Pakistan and uh, speaking to you in Chicago instead is because uh, uh, Pakistan, and only recently there has been an increase in censorship in Pakistan of the media. It's said that anything that is against the ideology of Pakistan is a threat to the country. So what you, when you have a paranoid state, then basically everything's a threat, threat and you, anybody who disagrees is a traitor. And if you're a traitor, then you are, your voice should be shut. My argument is that nations evolve through debate. In 1776, the United States only gave the right to vote to white men with property. Uh, there were slaves in this country. There were some people who said slavery is wrong. There was a debate about it. Uh, as a result, slavery was eliminated. Segregation was institutionalized in the South. There was debate about that, and segregation was done away with. There's still racism, and there's debate about that. And someday, there will be institutional mechanisms that completely eliminate that. That's how nations change and evolve. So if Pakistan has to change and evolve, it has to have open debate. It cannot say anybody who says Islam does not have a role in politics is an unbeliever, a blasphemer, and should therefore be sent to the gallows. That stops debate. Anybody who says 
What's the problem with India? Kashmir is maybe important, but it's not more important than the survival of Pakistan. Pakistan should have normal relations with India first and try to solve the problem of Kashmir later. Because most countries find it easier to resolve disputes by becoming friends first and resolving disputes later. If you, try, if you wait to solve the dispute first, you will wait forever. Uh, you say that, that is again, a it's, it, it's against the national identity and the national question. And similarly, uh, saying that maybe we need a leaner, meaner, fitter military rather than one that consumes so much of national resources is seen as being anti-military and therefore anti-Pakistan. Uh, my argument is that the process of reimagining Pakistan requires focusing on the real threats of inadequate economic performance, low human capital development, poor health and education statistics, rising extremism. Instead of seeing India as an eternal enemy and Afghanistan as a region where Pakistan's military can exercise its great power ambitions, Pakistan needs normal relations with its neighbors. Instead of demanding that India resolve the Kashmir dispute before trade and travel can be opened, it would be in Pakistan's interest to normalize relations with India even before disputes are resolved. Pakistan had developed a national ideology to survive after being carved out of British India. But now, 70 years later, when more than 95% of Pakistan's population has known no other citizenship except Pakistan's, that ideology has become a huge burden. The ideology of Pakistan is based on numerous factual inaccuracies in accounts of history that are taught to Pakistanis in schools and discussed constantly on mainstream and social media. It has become an instrument of keeping alive jihadi militancy and militarism and making Pakistanis believe that their country is constantly under threat and needs a strong army and nuclear weapons to protect it. And that if it has low literacy and inadequate health care, that is just a small price to pay to maintain the country's ideology and identity. Um, Henry Kissinger had once said that Iran must decide whether it is a country or a cause. Countries have interests that can be placated. Causes are often uh, 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 matters that cannot be easily negotiated over. The same applies to Pakistan, in my opinion. After 70 years as a country, which lost half its population and territory when East Pakistan became Bangladesh, it is time to think of Pakistan as a territorial state focused on creating wealth and prosperity for its 200 million citizens rather than an all-embracing cause with a huge ideology. Pakistan also needs a national purpose other than negative sentiments towards India, religious fundamentalism, or the elusive pursuit of Kashmir. My reimagination for Pakistan uh, has, uh, has resulted in what I consider to be a seven, point, seven bullet point agenda for Pakistanis. First, reconceptualize the country as a territorial rather than an ideological state. That will free you to make decisions and policies that would be very different from the policies that Pakistan has pursued consistently for the last 70 years. Two, discourage falsified narratives of history, conspiracy theories, and artificial or imaginary threats as tools of nation building and generating national identity. Accept the fact that 95% of the people recognize themselves as Pakistanis because they were born as Pakistanis. Three, dispense with the notion of strategic location being a source of economic rents from great powers. To explain this, just one comment. Pakistan has always believed that the United States needed Pakistan because of Pakistan's strategic location. Partly true. And now China needs it for strategic, uh, uh, in, because of its strategic importance. That's like having a plot of land somewhere and thinking that because everybody needs to go through it, therefore they will pay me for it, and that's all that is important. So I don't need to develop it, I don't need to do any agriculture there, I don't need to build anything there. And that often proves to be a wrong theory of trying to survive as a nation. Number four, develop pragmatic security and foreign policies without the idea of India as permanent enemy. Number five, invest in human capital development to lay the foundations of a self-sustaining economy. Number six, develop democracy with the intent of creating a less elitist society and state. 
and number seven, recognize Pakistan's ethnic and linguistic diversity and accept the multinational character of the Pakistani Federation. That reimagining of Pakistan could result in not only a better life for the people of Pakistan, but also take away the label of terrorist incubator, dangerous country, and difficult country that Pakistan has earned for itself over the last several decades. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ambassador Hakani. We do have some time for questions. Um, if you have a question, I'd kindly ask you to raise your hand. Please wait for me to call on you and speak into the microphone. And of course, make sure your question is a question. So we'll begin with the gentleman in the second row. Hi, thank you very much for being here and for your very holistic assessment. Um, my question is, how do you see both the current and future generations either widening and deepening or, or perhaps narrowing the gap between India and Pakistan. I ask with this level of context. Um, I'm a, my parents immigrated from India. I'm a first generation Indian American. And among people their age, my parents and grandparents age, it's at least not uncommon to see this residual resentment over partition. You know, it was very uh, visceral and real for them during their own seminal years. However, for people of my own generation, it seems like this is tribal politics. As you kind of mentioned, what's really the difference between our, our two groups of people? How do you see that impacting politics between the two nations? So basically in the diaspora, uh, the next gener the subsequent generations all become a lot less negative in their emotions, uh, partly because you know you are, uh, in, for example, you're in Peoria, Illinois. There's only about 50 brown families, you know, for using want, want of a, and so you know some are Indian, some are Pakistani, and a handful are Bangladeshis. You try to build on your commonalities to be able to have a sense of community, and therefore play down your uh, your differences. And as it moves forward. And the, and, and the tie to the uh, original land diminishes with each de generation, it becomes less. However, in India and in Pakistan, we must remember that since most people didn't see partition, how do young people learn about partition? They have what is known as transmitted memory. It is what they are told. And what they are told, especially in school curriculum, et cetera, and curriculum reform is a big part of what I propose uh, on the Pakistani side, uh, especially, but also now on the Indian side, because India also is also having a Hindu nationalist uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, revival, and Hindutva, as it's called, uh, essentially emphasizes the Hinduness of India rather than the uh, uh, than the secular character of uh, uh, India. Uh, so, I would say that the jury is out. The next generation may actually end up being even more hostile based on what they are taught and brought up uh, with, and the memories that are transmitted to them. Uh, Pakistanis are told that, you know, for example, all four wars, all independent accounts you read of the India Pakistan wars, Pakistan started each war. But all Pakistani accounts are we were attacked. So then you actually end up developing this thing that why are these people always attacking us? Um, uh, and, uh, and, and then, for example, on the Indian side, there is a playing up of, you know, well, look what happened in Mumbai, the terrorist attacks, what happened to the Indian parliament, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, and, and so both sides then end up feeding this in a cycle uh, that may necessar not necessarily resolve positively, which is why it's important for people like myself and others to speak out and say, hey, stop. You know, Pakistan is wrong on Mumbai, but the Indians are wrong to try and say that, you know, Pakistan should be broken up and divided, et cetera, which some Indians do say. And, uh, and, and so calm down and accept that you will be neighbors forever. And go back to what Mr. Jinnah said and India's leader, Nehru said, and uh, Gandhi said, that Gandhi said that this is like a division between two brothers. Uh, Jinnah said we should be like the United States and Canada. Uh, neither of them have been followed by their people. Uh, and so it's time to try and make those arguments and say there is a tremendous economic opportunity awaiting you. Uh, I don't know how many of you are on Twitter, but if you follow the Indian foreign minister on Twitter, you'll find something very interesting happening. Every now and then, a Pakistani will tweet at the Indian foreign minister and say, I have a sick child. That sick child needs such and such procedure. That procedure is more re readily and cheaply available in India. Uh, can I get a visa for my child and me to travel to India? And then the foreign minister will very generously kind of to score points say, 
I hereby approve your visa, go to the Indian embassy. But my point on that is, it should be a normal thing. I mean, if somebody in Michigan needs treatment that can better be acquired in Ontario, they just drive across the border. It's not like you have to make a big song and dance and get permission from the foreign minister and a huge hoopla. And the two sides won't make that happen. Uh, trade. Uh, India gave Pakistan the most favored nation status in 1998 after the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation said we will all give it to each other. Pakistan held it back and still hasn't given it. And uh, it's interesting that to think that until 1947, from all the way from what is today Bangladesh to what is today Afghanistan, uh, the whole region had one currency, one rail network, one telegraph system, etc., and integrated trade. Today, the, inter, the, inter, the trade between these countries is less than 5% of their mutual trade. Just to give you an idea, in Europe, the European Union, all trade between them, 50% of it is with each other. Between Canada, United States, and Mexico, the NAFTA members, 50% of their trade is among each other. And in case of Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Maldives, Bhutan, and Afghanistan, all of them together, only 5%, less than 5% of their trade is with one another. And that is really uh, something that will only be overcome by effort, not by default. Yes, Neve King in the front row, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Ambassador Khani. We love having a great talk. Um, I just wanted to explore your third point that you made about your seven prescriptions, the one about great powers and uh, strategic location, because as I understand it, Pakistan's a big part of the Belt Road Initiative out of China. So it, I think that might address some of your statistics that you so clearly gave us about infrastructure investment, potentially jobs. But uh, you didn't mention as part of the cadre of Iran, Israel, the West as being an enemy. How is the investment of China using Karachi as a port, from what I understand, and uh, developing in. How is that being viewed by the average conspiratorially um, susceptible Pakistani, Dep and how do they depends, view that? It depends on which side of the political divide in Pakistan you are on. Uh, one side thinks that this will be the panacea for all of Pakistan's ill. Pa China is going to put in $53 billion. Everything's going to be OK. There are people like me who would say these $53 billion uh, are going to be loans. They are all loans. Uh, China does not give grants, like the, unlike the United States. Uh, these are all infrastructure projects. Uh, infrastructure benefits uh, come only if that infrastructure is usable. So for example, a port is useful only if there are ships coming into it. A rain, railroad is useful only if goods are moving on it. So what are the goods that will move on it? Pakistan is certainly not producing them right now. There is no, edu info uh, no investment in education, healthcare, or uh, uh, human development in this Chinese package. What is happening is China has excess uh, uh, capacity right now, uh, which it is divesting and putting in other places. China already has cities where nobody lives. And they will in, they've already built a port in Sri Lanka that nobody uses. And, China, and Sri Lanka already has debt from it. Pakistan may end up in a similar position. We might end up with a debt trap of owing the Chinese 53 billion, having wonderful roads that link Pakistan to China, but no, nobody else. And secondly, it's interesting that Pakistani media and Pakistani propaganda paints CPEC, as it's called China, Pakistan Economic Corridor, as part of the one belt, one road. But in China, if you read the Chinese version of it, CPEC is a separate project linked to the One Belt, One Road, but it's not necessarily part of the One Belt, One Road. One Belt, One Road is basically meant to connect all these economically useful countries with one another. What China is trying to do is, China realizes that the United States has lost interest in Pakistan or is very upset with Pakistan, cannot invest uh, uh, in, in uh, Pakistan, especially with aid as it used to. China is trying to be helpful to Pakistan. Plus, Pakistan is a useful secondary deterrent. China does not want India to be the major power in Asia. And so what better than have a country keep 400,000 Indian troops tied down on its border so that they will not face China? So those two objectives are, are, are resolved by this. But the fundamentals don't change because the education problem, the healthcare problem, the uh, human cap capital development problem does not end. Only last week, uh, UNICEF came up with a very very, very frightening statistic. Pakistan, which is 
number 42nd in GDP, so therefore not really the worst off in, in, in economic terms in the world, uh, big uh, military capability, etc. now has the world's highest infant mortality rate. And China is not helping with that. That is something still the Western countries will end up having to do because they are the only ones who take an interest in that, at least so far. So you can see I'm not one of the upbeat ones on the CPEC. <laughs> We have many, many questions coming in through our conference's I.O. app. And I just want to remind for those watching at home that you can submit a question by typing chi.cnf.io. So I'm just going to ask a question from here. And you spoke about the, the long and complicated relationship that Pakistan has had with India. What is the path forward for building stronger relations with India? The path forward is to stop, from the Pakistani side, to stop objecting to trade and travel. Uh, without the resolution of the Kashmir dispute. That's the Pakistani position. Until Kashmir is resolved, no open trade, no open travel. I think that once open trade and travel starts taking place, the average Indian will start meeting more average Pakistanis, the average Pakistani will start meeting more Indians, the notion that we are eternal enemies will start subsiding. There will be huge economic benefits uh, because uh, uh, Pakistan will get a market of one billion opened to it, uh, Pakistan right now has excess capacity in cement. Cement is difficult to export. Uh, uh, right now, the only country Pakistan is able to export its cement to is Afghanistan right next door, and maybe some to Iran, although Iran makes its own. India, on the other hand, imports cement. It imports cement from South Korea, which comes on ships. From Pakistan, it will go on railway wagons. It will be cheaper, therefore, easier, and, and, and Pakistan would actually benefit from it, similarly for sugar and many other things. And so once you have an integrated economy, then your desire to fight one another diminishes. Taiwan, for many years, claimed to be the Republic of China, did not recognize the People's Republic. People's Republic of China to this day says Taiwan is integrate, an integral part of China. But the two countries now trade, and they have open travel, and they haven't solved their dispute. And at, at the same time, the likelihood that they are going to go to war or anything is also considerably less. And that is the path I think Pakistan should take, and India should encourage. Yes, the gentleman in the fourth row, please. What policy recommendations would you have for the United States to encourage this transformation? I have a sort of, first of all, I have a relatively critical view, and my second book, Magnificent Delusions, was about it. I think that the United States actually inadvertently contributed to Pakistan's dysfunction by helping it build itself militarily. Even on the nuclear question, it was American uh, uh, sort of uh, assistance and then subsequently tolerance uh, because America needed Pakistan for the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. So the first thing would be the Hippocratic Oath, do no further harm. So don't, don't, don't encourage the bad policy, uh, which I think the United States has already started doing. Uh, President uh, Obama started it, but President Trump has said it in his inimitable way, uh, sort of, you know, uh, no holds barred. And he's turned around and he said, you know, we are not going to just pour money and, and, and give aid, uh, which may make Pakistan think a little differently. Uh, uh, and, and, and secondly, I think that any investment in healthcare education, um, changing the uh, domestic uh, quality of life, which will then enable people to think differently than they have thought so far, uh, would definitely be positive contributions that can be made. And lastly, not only Pakistan, but elsewhere in the world also. The United, Na United States now needs to start thinking. You've been a superpower now since 1945, so it, you know, it's, a, it's a decent period of time to learn. And one of them is look at long-term consequences of policy instead of just the immediate and the short term. So for example, arming the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets had the consequence of 9-11 in some ways. Uh, it's something that you have to start building in into your policy of thinking, OK, this is what's going to be the five year, then the 10 year, then the 20. I sometimes joke that when you talk to the Chinese, they say, we have a short term plan, which is for the next 100 years. Uh, when you talk to the Americans, they say, we have a long term plan, which is for the next four years. And, and that needs to change significantly. Yes, the gentleman in the second row right there. Just wait for the microphone. What do you take as the probability that that transformation you've identified will happen 
given that you yourself were an advisor to four prime ministers, that you were in the- Each one of whom was thrown out of office. Well, so therefore, yeah. I, so, I had that, and you're, so, in, and you're in the United States, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what is so, the probability so, will happen? So, so I don't play the numbers, uh, but at the same time, I would say that <clears throat> in our lifetime, we've seen several problematic, dysfunctional states go through transformations. Some for the positive, some not necessarily for the positive. Usually the transformation comes by accident. So the Soviet Union collapsed not because somebody in the Soviet Union sat and designed it. It just happened. Uh, Yugoslavia collapsed uh, because it collapsed, not because somebody planned it. Uh, could we afford the collapse of a nuclear, uh, an unplanned collapse of a nuclear state? And if we cannot, then maybe there is need to think about transformation. Either the transformation will come by circumstances, uh, because dysfunction does not, dysfunction can last a long time, but it cannot last forever, because it does end up having consequences that, that need to be addressed. And I give the example of China. China made its transition from a Maoist economy to a Deng Xiaopingist economy. Uh, where the Communist Party remained in charge but became capitalist, uh, or sort, sort of capitalist, state capitalist, and improved its living standards and et cetera, et cetera, and they made that transformation as a result of a conscious decision. Um, so Pakistan has that choice. We can make a conscious decision or we don't make that conscious decision. At the moment, I don't see uh, too many takers for the idea of a conscious decision-led uh, uh, transformation, but I have seen things change pretty quickly. There was a time when I thought there were many things that would never happen in America, and I'm seeing them happen here. Uh, so uh, both negative and positive transformations sometimes take place without anybody seriously planning for them or evaluating their probability. Another question from Conferences IO. Has US funding over the years helped or hurt Pakistan? So I would argue that it has helped Pakistan sustain itself. It has helped Pakistan build itself. It has helped Pakistan uh, be where it is today. It has hurt Pakistan because it did not enable Pakistan to think many things through that would have otherwise been thought through. I think the conflict with India would have not lasted as long if Pakistan did not think that it will be able to have American qualitative military equipment. And so they always thought our numbers will be less, but we will have the better equipment. And so therefore, we will have an advantage. Uh, it's an irony, but each, each phase of American military assistance to Pakistan has led to a war between India and Pakistan. Uh, and, and that's the negative side to that American assistance. But the positive side is that Pakistan wouldn't be where it is today if it hadn't been for American assistance, American and other assistance. The gentleman in the back row. Um, Salam alaikum, and thank you for speaking so articulately about the challenges in the region. Um, so you talked about your seven sort of um, ideas for what some maybe Pakistanis should start believing in or shifting their belief system towards. So I'm kind of curious, as someone who is a Pakistani passport holder, if I decide to take this book and go back home, do you have some ideas for what someone could actually go do on the ground or in person there that would potentially push us towards these beliefs or these ideas? So a lot of these transformative ideas are essentially in the realm of policy. If you're looking for what you can do as an individual, maybe you can just help build the ideas and create the ground momentum for the policy changes. But uh, uh, as an individual, for example, you can make friends with this gentleman who's from India, uh, but, you can't, but you can't, as an individual, make Pakistan shake hands with India and stop firing across the line of control and get, get uh, and, and the Indians stop firing across the line of control. There are limited, uh, 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 th there are limits to what an individual can do in the policy realm other than trying to convince others of the value of the new policy ideas. Yes, the gentleman on the fourth row there. Thank you for coming and giving us a talk, Mr. Ambassador. What's your opinion of the ISI's performance over the past oh, three decades or so? Gosh, um, so <laughs> who's, who's serving breakfast? Uh, the ISI it was initially Pakistan's strategic intelligence service. Unfortunately, it has become overbearing and uh, 
uh, ubiquitous. It has acquired the role that the Stasi had in East Germany or the KGB had in the Soviet Union. It interferes in politics. It tries to fix elections. It tries to tell the media what to do. Uh, it hounds in dissidents. Uh, and it has become the keeper of the quote unquote ideology of Pakistan, in addition to supporting, training, and equipping militants and terrorists uh, who they think are going to uphold Pakistan's interest by keeping Afghanistan and Americans in Afghanistan uh, sort of uh, on a short leash and keeping India uh, on their toes in Kashmir. So all in all, I think that the among the institutional reform agendas for Pakistan, reforming the ISI would probably be number one. We have time for a couple more questions. Once again, our VP, Neet King. <laughs> Go to the microphone there, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, just one, to, uh, since you last came here, Ambassador Khani, has your thinking or exposure to information at all changed your view on the Osama bin Laden case and whether or not it was incompetence or it was... Uh so a lot has been written since then. I have met many people who, were, uh, who worked, uh, who I interacted with at that time. The last time I came here, I said, and you, I'm glad you remember that phrase, I said that it was either incompetence or it was, uh, it was complicity or incompetence. Uh, I'm still there. Uh, somebody knew, somebody helped him stay there. Whether it was by complicity at the highest levels or incompetence at the highest levels, we still do not have a definitive answer. But the fact remains that it was something that Pakistan should have paid greater attention to than it did. Uh, you remember me at that time, I in fact lost, lost my office over that. I always said Pakistan needs to get to the bottom of this because it has implications for Pakistan long term instead of trying to shove it under the carpet. But Pakistan has chosen to shove it under the carpet and many Pakistanis also don't like asking the question. They feel uncomfortable. It's like one of those things where, you know, sort of that uncle who went to prison, you don't want to talk about him. Uh, well, it's, uh, sometimes you need to talk about him. Uh, especially if he molested somebody uh, uh, underage in your family. Uh, and, and in this particular case, whether it was complicity or it was incompetence, Osama bin Laden's presence in Pakistan raises many, many, many questions about Pakistan's state and how it functions. If it was incompetence, it was massive incompetence at multiple layers. Why couldn't the local police know? Why didn't the... Um, uh, usually beat policemen know a lot that's happening in their, on their beat. Uh, why didn't the higher authorities know? Why didn't the ISI that sometimes knows uh, what I'm saying to the Chicago Council, there's probably a report going to be written up on this, why can't they have known what the world's number one terrorist was there? Second, why was General Musharraf actively disinforming the world in his many interviews after 9-11, in which he went from saying, my reports indicate he is sick, my reports indicate he's dead, my reports indicate he's in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a whole collection of things. And all of that needs to be understood, examined, and resolved, and it hasn't. And that, to me, is worrisome. I don't have a definitive answer even now. Two years from now, maybe invite me again. We have time for one more question, and um, I will give that to you because I know you've been waiting. Thank you. Um, you started out by talking about the limited view we have of Pakistanis, and I'd, I would characterize what you've shared as dark. Um, and so for someone who is interested in visiting Pakistan someday, what positive message um, uplifting, something uplifting, could you leave with us? Because I've never gone, and I'd love to go, and perhaps many of us listening in have never gone and would love to go or may never go, but what positive message could you leave with us um, to give us a, a broader impression? Of the I think people? I started with the positive. Pakistan is a nation of very hospitable people. All accounts of Pakistanis is that it's a very hospitable nation. It's a people who are generally very uh, welcoming of foreigners. They are very welcoming of outsiders. They are people who will open their homes and their uh, hearts to you. Uh, it is unfortunate that they are caught uh, in a cycle in which their state and their government policies are not necessarily moving uh, their country uh, in the right direction. Uh, as far as the uh, 
uh, land is concerned, it's pretty beautiful, especially if you go in the north, you will find wonderful mountains. Uh, the south is deserts, the southwest is uh, desert come mountains, um, and you have a wonderful public, one, wonderful people. That said, let me say one thing. I find this a lot, you know, give me something positive. Sometimes understanding the world involves a little bit of com complexity. So, for example, anybody who's talking about Iran right now will be focused on Iran's policies, how the mullahs are running the country, etc. And by the way, the rest of the world approaches you the same way. Uh, visitors to the United States, I hope you know that the number of visitors to the United States has declined uh, since the last election. Uh, the number of tourists from abroad is falling. It's happening because of what people read, which is always policy. Doesn't mean any of you have changed doesn't mean the nice guy who welcomed me to the hotel that I'm staying at has changed. He's still the same guy. Uh, what happens is nations are recognized across borders essentially by their overall policies and their orientation rather than by the conduct of their individual citizens. So the individual citizens of Pakistan remain as nice as they were and will probably always remain as nice as they are. Thank you. Thank you. That is, that is all we have time for. I would just like to encourage you all to stay for our networking reception, and Ambassador Haqqani will be signing his book, Reimagining Pakistan. It's being sold at $25, and it's being sold by the bookseller right there. Thank you once again very much. Thank you.